Hi, and welcome to Cryptobiography. I'm your host, Brandon Starr, and this is episode 126, A Bloody Wish. And this episode is a little different. Um, what's been going on is I have a, like a longer writing project that I want to do, sort of novel length, perhaps, or at least novella for sure, and it's going to require more planning than, you know, the shorter stories that I've been doing, even some of the multi-episode ones that I've been doing, you know, end up being, you know, not quite novella length, uh, even after all those episodes. So if I'm going to do something like that, I need some time to plan it. Um, however, I found that when I was trying to do that and also split that with doing new writing for this week, I had troubles doing that. Um, I got a little writing done, but it just wasn't coming together. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I wanted to put out as an episode. So... Uh, so I thought, well, you know what, um, I have been doing writing before, um, uh, the last few years, um, following my wife's death, I started writing, writing again, and I, you know, a lot of this was before cryptobiography. Now, cryptobiography, I, I've been writing as I've gone. I haven't gone back to any of this older material and used any of it. Um, but I figure if I'm gonna if I'm gonna need you know to get this sort of time together for a longer project, then you know and and have something decent to put out for cryptobiography that week, uh, I, what I instead what I should do is go back to some of this older writing, do a bit of editing, clean it up, and put that as the episode. And that's what I've decided to do. So we have an up. Uh, it's still you know very much my style. I think um, I, I I have sort of evolved my style a little bit. I would say over the last you know like year and a half of doing cryptobiography uh, as a fictional podcast. Uh, but you know it's still me <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, so we do have a short story today. It is self-contained. It's going to be one episode. Hopefully this will be enough time to give me a little more time. But if I have to go back into the well and go back into that that last year or so, whatever it was of writing before that, maybe find another episode or two. You know, I will I will do that, but I'll just have to keep progressing. So, hope you enjoy it. Uh, this, again, is a, called A Bloody Wish, and it's, uh, yeah, well, you'll see what it is pretty quickly. Here we go. They rode single file towards the town, making their way along shallow gullies that cracked this nearly desert land. Their horses picked the paths carefully and even occasionally stumbled on loose rocks that had been kicked up by flash floods. Frank wondered when the last flood had been. The late summer vegetation looked as though it hadn't seen a drop all year. The three of them stopped at the top of a hill where they could see the town a hopeful spring lay. It was a baseless hope, Frank thought. This place could have been hell. They looked down at the town, really just a main street and nothing else, with a road stretching away at either side. It was like a single bead on a leather thong. Looks quiet enough, Dylan said, squinting even more than usual. They were coming from the east, and the setting sun was getting bright in their eyes, which they shaded by pulling their hats as low as they could. Looks are deceiving, Walt said. Let's get off this ridge before the, everyone and their brother knows we're coming. Hell, they'd probably already been spotted, Frank thought, but kept it to himself. Walt especially hated when folks around him pointed out the obvious, and Frank hated arguments. They picked a path that didn't look to go straight to the town. Instead, it meandered off to the side like it didn't want to go any nearer the town than it had to. Or maybe that was Frank's wishful thinking. Dylan, at the, thought, at the front, craned his head back over his shoulder. Maybe we should wait until dark before going in, he asked. Quiet, Walt said. No, we're going in now. Frank kept himself quiet. He'd been told the plan. There wasn't supposed to be any fighting. Not here in Hopeful Spring, anyway. This was just supposed to be another step in catching up with the one they wanted. But fighting could still happen. He automatically reached down and patted the butt of his revolver, making sure it was there, though its reassuring weight had never left his side. But at night, Dylan started. Shut it, Walt said. We're not the thieves. We're not the killers. Yet thought Frank. They leaned back in their saddles as the horses picked their way downhill. Though they could only occasionally see the buildings now, Frank tried to figure out how many there were and what they were, and what kind of people lived in this town and in each building. He spotted the general store briefly, and what was likely the biggest town stable was close to them. 
The peak of a church steeple pointed up out of a cluster of buildings at the far side of the town, shadowed like a warning finger. Mama wouldn't have been none too thrilled to see us today, he thought. But then again, maybe she would have understood. After all, it was her daughter as much as their sister they were looking to help. Help, or just avenge? Frank didn't like these thoughts, but couldn't help himself. They moved slowly enough, cautiously enough, that the sun had nearly touched the horizon by the time they approached the buildings. The streets were empty. They saw us, Frank thought. They were warned. There's a saloon right in the middle of town they made for it. He got off their horses and timed the hitching post and went in. Frank noticed even outside that it was quiet. No music, no voices. Their eyes took a moment to adjust to the relative gloom. The room was half full of people, all of whom were looking at the three men. Walt decided to keep the tone light. Evening, gents, he called to the room at large. I take it we can get something to wet our whistles here? Some can, said the bartender. You can't. Walt froze for a moment. Our money spends as good as anyone else's. Not here, don't, the bartender said. Get along. There's an inn above the general store. They'll take you for the night. Then I suggest you move along. But we're just getting into town after a long, hard ride, Walt said. Frank looked over at Dylan, who seemed to be sizing up the room. He had a feeling Walt was, too, though he covered it well with his banter. Frank wasn't sure how to even go about doing that, so he just kept his mouth shut and did his best to look tough. So you'll be wanting a bed, the bartender said. But in my place, I don't serve folks spoiling for trouble, especially strangers. Spoiling for trouble, Walt said, putting a laugh in his tone. Friend, we're spoiling for a drink, maybe some talk and some rest. Trouble ain't on our agenda. So you say, replied the bartender, but not everyone says the same. Well, now we do have something to talk about, Walt said. Frank continued looking around the room. Most of them looked scared, like they didn't want to be in a place where a gunfight might erupt. But inexperienced as he was, Frank was able to see some who were looking on with more than a little interest. He suspected these men would be all too glad to join in on a fight. No drinks and no talk, the bartender said. Out. That didn't leave Walt with much choice but to go ahead. Okay, he said, but his tone was to the room at large rather than the bartender. We're heading out. You know where we'll be. We're looking for a man named John Quincy. He done some real wrong to our poor sister and killed her husband. If you can help us find him, we'll be most grateful. We can even make it worth your while. Good night. Walt stepped back and the three of them left the saloon. They made their way to the general store. Think we'll have any luck? Frank asked Walt. No way to tell. Walt well, replied, we did our best. I'm wondering who badmouthed us like that. I'm wondering if it's old John Quincy hiding somewhere in town or nearby, or maybe he has friends. Maybe, Dylan said. Reckon there's any danger to staying here in town? I doubt it, Walt said, but we're going to take precautions anyway. The general store was closing for the night, but the proprietor was inside and came to the door when they knocked. We need a room, Walt said simply. It'll be around back, the man said. He has crinkles around his eyes that spoke of a friendly manner, and white hair that was thin as May snow on top. That'll be fine, Walt said. There's a chance someone will be come by to talk to us. If they do, can you send them around? The man gave an expression that the request was a little unusual, but no problem. Sure, if I see anyone, he said. We're closing the store, but I'm usually down here for a couple hours anyway, cleaning up and whatnot. I can send them back to you if they come to call. Much obliged, Walt said. He handed the man some bills and took a key. They went round back and found a set of stairs on the outside that led to the second floor. The room was built to be totally separate from any other part of the general store or what was certainly the owner's living quarters, presumably on the front portion of the second story. Only one door to worry about, Dylan said. Sounds good. When it comes time to sleep, we'll take turns at watch. Of course, tonight, hopefully, we'll get someone with some information. I figure there's at least a chance they'll wait until late at night if they want to avoid letting their friends know that they're selling information to us. 
Frank found out that Walt was right. He was watching, keeping a lookout from the small landing at the top of the stairs and jumping at every noise. He jumped even higher when he heard a hiss from somewhere below. He put a hand on the butt of his pistol, but did not draw and looked towards the sound. Couldn't tell who it was, but there was enough light to see that whoever it was had his hands extended out way from his sides in a way that was meant to show he didn't have a gun. Who's there? Frank whispered down. I want to come up. I got some information, came the reply, in the same sort of hissing whisper. Frank knocked on the door two times, twice, the signal that something was up but not an emergency. In just a moment, Dylan came out with Walt standing behind, carrying a lantern. Guy says he wants to come talk, Frank said, pointing down. Fine, let him come up, Walt said. Frank motioned at the man, who seemed reluctant. After a moment, Frank said, Turn that light off, Walt. I think he doesn't want to be seen, and it's making him nervous. Walt dimmed the lantern and put it somewhere inside where it didn't show, and the stairs became as dark as ever. The man came up and stopped just a few steps down. Come on in, Frank whispered. The man followed Frank in. He was skinny, about 30, and had dirty blonde hair that stopped around his shoulders, probably cut off with a big knife every few months. He'd seen Walt size up this look before. It signaled a man who didn't have a lot of money, even to buy a simple haircut at a barber, or maybe who lived so far out of town that he didn't ha always have one available. Who are you? asked Walt. Name's Pete Sand, the man said. I work at the stables. He's in town, thought Frank, so he must not have much money. And a stable hand usually doesn't earn much. Maybe he sees a big payday with us. What do you have to tell us? I know where John Quincy is, Pete said. He's at the Showman Ranch, northwest of here, about five miles. Why is he there? Walt asked. I hear their relations, Pete said. Never heard exactly how. Cousins, maybe? When did he arrive? Walt asked. Don't know when he first got to the Showman place, but he was at the stables three days ago. I heard him and Mr. Showman talking some. Sounds like they was fixin' to get some supplies. What kind? Like food? Walt asked. Frank could tell he was hoping to find out if Quincy had plans to stay at the Showman Ranch or hit the trail again. Now they mentioned some pemmican, but also some tack, Pete said. Sounded like some part of his gear was damaged. The three brothers didn't say anything, but Frank felt the hairs on his neck go up. Two weeks ago, Dylan had taken a shot with his rifle... Uh, at long range at John Quincy. The man hadn't been hit, but Dylan swore up and down that he'd seen something fly out when he took the shot. He must have hit the bridle or one of the straps on the saddle. He hadn't stopped Quincy, but now that he was someplace he felt safe, he wanted to get it repaired. And you say this showman place is five miles northwest? Any landmarks? Walt asked. Showman place ain't hard to find. They build it at the top of the biggest hill over there. You'll spot it easy enough. Pete said. Walt looked at his brothers as if to give them a chance to jump in. Dylan did so. How many folks live at that ranch? He asked. Oh, uh, there's six showmans. His wife, three kids, and the wife's brother who all live there. Pete said. There can be some ranch hands too, but sometimes they're out on the range. No telling. Did Quincy have anyone with him? Frank asked though John Quincy had always traveled alone until now. Just Mr. Showman, far as I know, Pete answered. Thanks, Pete, Walt said, pulling out some bills and counting them out. Frank wasn't sure how much he had given Pete, but judging by the size of his eyes when he saw the wad of money in his hand, it was enough. Walt never felt an expense was too much when it came to righting a wrong, and Frank had never seen Walt as determined, as obsessed as he had, with this horror show done to their sister Mary. Frank and his brother still had no idea what set John Quincy off, but they found Mary's husband, Tom, dead in front of their house, Mary herself unconscious, the baby beaten right out of her womb, and other things done to her that Frank just couldn't think about. It was a miracle Mary had survived at all. They nursed Mary along best they could until their Aunt Jane had come from her home about a hundred miles off, and then they took off after him. Mary confirmed who it was when she woke up. She said she didn't know why he'd done it. Frank wasn't sure she was telling the truth, but 
None of them were going to push her too hard, given what happened. They were just going to make sure John Quincy paid. Wall had decided that they would wait the day out and then set out for the showman ranch in the evening. Doing it now would mean it would already be light by the time they found the place, and during the day it was no time to be riding up to a place intent on killing someone. But any longer and it increased the chances Quincy would catch wind of trouble and pull up stakes. It was a long, tense day. They kept watch all that day as well, just in case of trouble. The only game, they came out only once, early, and bought a few provisions from the general store, then holed up in their room. None of them slept too well, though Dylan seemed to be doing the best at it. As the sun started to get low, they set off. They purposely went northeast, away from the hills, but also a quick way out of town. Only when they were completely out of sight did they start to loop around towards the northwest. Just before sundown, they approached the top of a good-sized hill. Walt held them back with a gesture, gave his reins to Dylan, and moved off to the hilltop. Frank was thinking about what they would do when they got to the ranch house. He wanted Quincy dead, just like his brothers, but he really didn't want anyone else dead just to get him. His brothers were of a different mindset, though. Dylan, just that afternoon, had said that anyone helping hide that son of a bitch deserved to die, too. Maybe. Frank said, but what about those three kids the showman's had? Walt took a good long look around, then came back down. Yeah, it's a ways off, but Pete was right. It is right at the top of a big hill. We're going the right way. See anyone? Dylan asked. Too far away, Walt said. Plan? Frank asked. Avoid hilltops for now. Don't know when they'll be able to spot us if we're up high. Keep our eyes open. Then go in on foot when we're close. Frank didn't say anything. Dylan nodded and said, Okay. The closer they got, the worse Frank felt. He remembered when Dylan took that long shot at Quincy and the bullet popped something on his saddle. His guts had gone to water. Now he was going to a fight for real, one that surely would end in bloodshed. He didn't know if his anger would be able to overcome his fear, loathing of the violence, whatever it was. But he wasn't about to cut out on his brothers either. If he left them for his squeamishness and they got killed, he wouldn't be able to forgive himself. He wondered how bad his hands might shake when the bullets were flying. Would he be able to aim? Soon enough it was time. They got off their horses and tied them to the trees. We'll go real slow. Any sign of trouble and we come right back here to the horses. Got it? Walt said quietly. They headed up, crouching at first then crawling. Frank took his cue from how Walt and Dylan acted. He was in the back and felt his hand go to his gun every so often as though it might have fallen out of his holster without his noticing. The horses started wickering and whinnying behind them. Walt made a slight noise as though he wanted to cuss but didn't dare. Go back there and calm them horses down. Lead them farther away if you have to. Got it? Frank said, yeah. As quietly as he could, turned round and made his way, somewhat quicker than the way up, back to the horses. He nearly got his hand on the first horse to calm it when he heard a click right behind his ear. Hold it, a man's voice said. Frank turned around and nausea rose in his throat. There were multiple men, all of them with pistols or rifles pointed right at him. So I guess our information was right after all, the man said. Stranger, you're about to learn a lesson not to trust that a man who sells you information won't do the same to the other guy. Now you just give a whistle and call your brothers back here. You do that, I'll let you go. I think we can let one snake in the grass slither away if we catch two others and hang them from a tree. Frank just stared. Now, don't make this hard on yourself. The other option is, we kill you, and then we go up the hill, surround those two brothers of yours, and shoot them to ribbons. Then all three of you are dead. Three's bigger than two. Even a no-account criminal like yourself must have heard that before. There were a few low chuckles from the men around. I'm still amazed that old Pete story got you guys out here, the man said. You never even did the most basic scouting around. This house has been empty for five years, when the well went dry. Near anyone around could have told you that. Ain't no family here, ain't no kids here, and sure ain't no John Quincy here. Frank had nothing to say. 
Now, old John Quincy, he's a friend of a lot of folks around here, and we don't take to you coming after him like you're a judge, preacher, and lawman all rolled up into one. He hurt our sister, Frank said. Says you, the man said. Well, you just call your boys down here and we can settle things. Frank drew in his breath, jumped away, and screamed, Boys! It's an ambush! Run! He barely had time to get those words out before any number of shots tore into him. He didn't know how many. He only knew that his body suddenly went numb and he was looking up at the sky, unable to move and breathing shallowly. He's done for. Let's go get his brothers before they figure out a way out of here, the man said. Frank wondered idly what the man's name was. He heard them run off up the hill. He couldn't do anything, but the stars were growing fainter. He could still hear. He listened for gunshots, but heard none. I'm of some use, he thought to himself. I'm of some use, after all. And that's the end of our tale. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any comments or questions about this episode or previous episodes, cryptobiography at gmail.com or hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you for listening. Words and music, copyright 2019, cryptobiography, LLC, all rights reserved. Characters and events are fictional, fictionalized, or satirical.